um, thrilled to have you on the on Zoom today. Thank you very much for joining us for this a series of interviews um, on the impact of COVID-19 on peace and security. Um, so I just want to give you a couple of minutes to introduce yourself for the audience, and then we'll go right into the topic. Olivia, it's great to be talking to you there in Brussels, and I'm here in Boston. Um, and um, as you um, have uh, suggested, I think about militarism a lot. I think about the ways militarism operates in all kinds of settings, including public health crises. And I think a lot about why we always have to pay attention to women's distinctive experiences. Not to ignore men, but to make men's lives more understandable as well. Thank you. So I'm um, talking to you in a very um, sad, dramatic context today uh, with the pandemic, uh, COVID-19, um, disseminating uh, people around the world uh, and affecting people in different ways around the world based on the different contexts. So because of your specialization, can I ask you what your assessment is of how this pandemic is affecting men and women differently in different contexts? Well, I think first we have to all remind ourselves that even when things are disastrous, whether it be after an earthquake or during a war or now during a public health crisis, you always, you, me, we, always have to ask gender questions. Oh, you never know the answer. You always have to ask them because the temptation is when the crisis seems acute, there's a temptation to say, not now, later. Gender is peripheral. We won't ask those questions till later and then later never comes or you miss the data. So one of the things that is striking about a public health crisis are at least two things, maybe three. The first is, well, who are healthcare workers? And if you take all healthcare workers from the brain surgeon down to the hospital cleaner, so that's all healthcare workers in all sites, in nursing homes, as well as elite hospitals, you do a gender analysis of who's where in the country, whatever country you're trying to understand, who's, who's there, who are the main um, paramedics, who are the orderlies, who is who are the cleaners? I have a couple of friends who, uh, neighbors, who work um, as non-nurse, uh, non-doctor workers, and they were amongst the last to get masks, right? So you always do gender analysis and say, where are the women? Where are the men? Why does it matter? How does it help you understand what's going on? Who's being protected? Who's not? Who's doing the hard work? Who's getting privilege? So that's the first thing. The second thing in this virus um, response is the shutdown as the main preventive uh, effort. That is in every country, whether it be in South Korea or the US or Belgium or the UK or Brazil, what does shutdown mean for women and what does it mean for men? So for those people who are privileged enough to quote unquote work at home, which means they have computers and they have the kind of jobs they can do work at home. And that's mostly the most privileged workers who can work from home. What percentage are women? What percentage are men? But also, if women are working at home, but they have all, they are still expected by their male partners to have all the childcare responsibility. And if they have an older generation living with them, all the elder care responsibility then working at home for a woman is really different than working home from a, for a man, even amongst those privileged people who can work at home. For those people who can't work at home, who are considered essential, what percentage are women and what percentage are men, but also what jobs are they doing? How risky are the jobs that men outside the home still have to do because they're essential? And we're all learning that essential now means amongst the lowest paid workers in our countries. Um, and where are women and where are men? And in the shutdown, one always has to ask who's living with an abusive partner or who's living with a partner who handles stress 
less well and may not have been terribly abusive before, but has under stress is becoming more abusive. And what we're hearing now from many countries is that it is women who are more subject to abuse in the home. I mean, we've known this before, but it carries now under these lockdown conditions. So those are three different questions that allow us to see the gender dynamics that either change or deepen, or maybe even get diluted, you don't know to the ask, in the midst of this public health crisis. Thank you very much. Let me turn a little bit now to um, some of the uh, refugee camps uh, in some areas of, of Europe that you may have heard about, but also conflict zones. We know that in conflict zones, um, the health systems are not going to be able to provide the same services as in um, uh, Europe or even the US. Um, uh, but also, again, this is going to affect men and women differently. Are there some other aspects of this that we've not thought about for uh, men and women in those uh, contexts? Well, I think one of the real dangers in the middle of this public health crisis that's affecting all of us um, is that we then get distracted and don't think about men and women and children, boys and girls in refugee camps as if, well, we paid attention to them back in December, but now in April, who's got the mind space to think about refugees? But in fact, this is exactly the moment to think about the most vulnerable and people who have been displaced either internally or outside their own country and now are living as displaced persons or refugees, they are amongst the most uh, vulnerable. I haven't seen the latest UNHCR, UN High Commission for Refugee figures, but the last figures I saw, women, with, and this is always the phrase that is so important, women with their dependent children. So that's different than women and children. Women with their dependent children are, I think over 75%, of all refugees that at least are counted by UNHCR. So that means that if refugee camps, and that's the easiest to count is versus refugees who are spread through southern Turkey, for instance, outside of camps. Um, that means that if the virus, which is highly infectious, spreads to a place where you cannot do social distancing and where healthcare is minimal at best, it means that more women with their dependent children are going to be susceptible to this deadly virus than our men. It doesn't mean that men, in fact, some of the public health figures show that men, if they get sick, and this is about autoimmune systems, men are more likely to die than women if they get COVID-19. But within a refugee camp, they're going to be 70% of all refugees are women with their dependent children in the worst kind of settings for the coronavirus um, because of crowded conditions and weak public health systems. It becomes even more so if you are in Yemen or northern Syria right now, or if you're on the border of um, Myanmar and Bangladesh, you know, conflict zones because there um, you really, you don't have information. You're oftentimes mainly just trying to protect yourself from physical immediate violence. Um, and also the gendering of the conflict, which means that most of the people who have guns, that is the, the instruments of violence, are going to be men. That doesn't mean all men are wielding instruments of violence, but those who are wielding those instruments are men. And most of the women who are the objects of that um, are the carers of children. So war zones are always gendered. And when a public health crisis hits, it usually means that whatever gender disparities existed before are gonna become intensified. That's one of the things we've now learned over the last 30 years of war zone analysis by feminist uh, researchers. Thank you very much. Um, you've recently published uh, an article entitled COVID-19, Waging War Against a Virus is Not What We Need to Be Doing. 
So I'd like to ask you, why do you think this war narrative is actually used in these times? And why is it dangerous? Yes, I was asked to submit um, a, a short blog, really, um, uh, for by the uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and called WILP, and it's up on their website. And that, because WILP is one of my um, uh, most admired organizations, peace organizations, um, I really thought about what they've been doing for years, which is trying to really unpack why so many of us, and none of us are immune. You know, you can be a feminist, even a feminist peace activist, and start talking about in English, in the trenches, or going to the front. I mean, we all just, it's in our brains, and it's very insidious. So I really tried to put out there what I'm susceptible to. It's not as if I'm immune and I'm saying, no, 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 don't do that. I'm saying, oh my God, I use that term. And it's because the war narrative, um, in fact, privileges certain kinds of masculinities, not all. Um, homophobia exists against gay men in war. Um, but it privileges certain kinds of masculinities and it turns women into simply supporters or victims. That is people who don't have a seat at the decision-making table. So war narratives are very um, seductive because they usually are encouraging us to see we are all in this together. That's the usual war mobilization narrative, whether it be in Britain or the US or, any country, we are all in this together. And we aren't all in this together. We're all on the same rough seas together, but we're in very different boats. And some of those boats are very leaky. And some of those boats, boats are never given oars. And some of those boats have high powered motors on them. We are not all in the same boat. We all are on the same rough seas. And I think the war narrative if you pardon the pun, camouflages that, masks that, another pun for the day. Um, that is, it, the war narrative is intended to make us forget how different and unequal decision-making power is. Mm, thank you. What do you think the long-term effects of this type of narrative uh, can be on society and what opportunities are there for um, civil society academics like you, um, uh, civil society like Quaker Council for European Affairs? What opportunities are there to make sure that we don't go backwards after this uh, health crisis um, and actually ensure that equality, freedom, all these really important values actually are maintained um, and, it, and it can bring something good uh, rather than uh, go steps backwards? Well, I think you're speaking out now. Don't wait until it's over. You know, there's this, this mythical time now that's already being talked about, which post-pandemic. And what we know from wars, I mean, feminist analyses of wars, that is the preparation for what is post happens during. You can't wait till after and think, oh, then we'll start talking about feminist um, uh, notions of justice and social safety nets. You can't wait. You have to do it now. And you do it now by raising uh, warning flags. That's a weather analogy, not a war analogy. Um, you raise your bright yellow um, weather flags right now. And you speak out about it and you start talking about, well, what have we, what positive things have we learned? Because already people are going to be creating narratives of the lessons. And you have to start really talking back to those false lessons now, I think, um, and start talking about, well, we've learned about essential workers. Now that's an absolutely crucial new understanding that somebody who works in a grocery store as a low paid hourly part-time worker is essential to our social fabric. That people who clean hospitals are essential to our sense of genuine security, not militarized security. And if those people are essential,
then they have to be treated as people who should be at the table, who should be rewarded fairly, and should have rights in their workplace. And we're learning that now. We just have to remember what we've learned. That's great. Thank you very much. I won't take up more of your time, but I really appreciate it. And I hope we'll have more opportunities to discuss this um, important time period together. Thank you. And I really admire the work you're doing. Thank you so much.